All right. Hello, welcome to the Compassionate Capitalist Radio Podcast. This is Karen Rands, your host, and uh, this is uh, going to be an interesting show because we're doing it all as a YouTube video as well as um, as a podcast. So I want to encourage people to go and get the look at the link for in the profile for the YouTube if they want to see the visuals on this uh, and because uh, it's going to be really interesting. I have a really terrific guest and one of the things for people that have listened to this show on a regular basis is that I, I'm always looking for really innovative and exciting maverick type of businesses that can be showcased that have um, sort of you know, not necessarily done the norm. They've been, uh, it's a, and, and entrepreneurs that have forged their pathway to pursue their dream and their passion so that they can, you know, do something they love, which is the passion that kind of comes into the compassionate capitalist, right. And make money, right. It's the capitalist side of it. And then you have a, an entrepreneur with a passion that creates a company and with the investors that I train to invest in companies, they look at that from a compassionate capitalist standpoint because they're pursuing uh, helping a, uh, bring innovation to the market and fund the passion in the company. So that's sort of a play on words, how that goes together. And so my guest today today is uh, Sarah Dahman, and um, she really has been a maverick. It's been when we first talked before we were getting up the show, I was just stunned. And then going back and looking at her bio, uh, she, you know, started out with, uh, you know, it's, I, so you sort of call it storied and a, a varied career because she started out doing commercials for uh, Sitco. Then she started a event planning business, a wedding planning business. Um, she'll talk about sort of her pathway and her motivations in that. That became a Silver Anvil award-winning um, event coordinating company. And then uh, after she sold that, she was looking to write a book. Uh, it was called, It's called Widow 1881 and um, won a Laramie Award for that for historical, Western historical fiction and fiction book of the year from Arthur Circle. And but in the course of doing her research for that research for that she discovered this lost art of making copper and tin cookware and there's no other women she she's pretty certain she's the only woman that does this there's very few people in the united states that actually even have this skill and uh so as she's gone through her pathway to you know you know it's not like you just you just start knitting or something that everybody can do this is something that is very specialized has very special equipment has you know special materials and a talent that is um you know that artisan it's almost you know lost within our current you know history of the united states and so I, I just thought this was just going to be fascinating to learn about her journey. She's going to give us a, a little demonstration or show us her workshop here in a little bit. Uh, but I wanted to, I want other entrepreneurs out there that are thinking about and are facing a, an unknown, a fear of going out and starting their own business um, or something that they think might just be kind of crazy. You know, should I go do this? Nobody else doing it. I'm not sure if there's a marketplace, any of that kind of stuff that to hear about Sarah's story so that you can know that there's um, not only a woman that stepped out of her comfort zone to go do this, you know, plenty of women do event planning businesses. Um, but you know, for artisan, it's a, it's a small niche of people, but also even a smaller niche for a woman to be able to do this. And uh, I just think she's going to have a great story to tell. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome onto the show. Hi, Sarah. Welcome Hi, to the Sarah. Capitalist Podcast. Uh, Thank you. So, you know, I know. Um, let's talk about let's, let's let's talk about your passion. Talk about your path of how you why you went from corporate world to become an entrepreneur first, and then we'll talk about how you went from running a traditional type of a business to running a real market maker type of a business. You know, re re energizing a whole new uh, area of of uh, skilled talent, I guess. I'm not quite sure. You'll probably give me some good words. <laughs> I, yeah, like that. a skilled trade. Yeah, no, I know. It's almost like we don't even have the vocabulary for it anymore. It's so old, you know, it's almost lost. Um, well, you know, starting out in the corporate world, it was the path that everyone is kind of told to take, right? Yeah. These days, 
Um, and you're, you're, you're encouraged to go white collar, you're encouraged to get a four year degree. And from there, everything just kind of snowballs into the, the corporate world. And, and I was in advertising and I was in marketing. So I was making these, you know, commercials and producing advertisements and, um, and, and it was fun and it was challenging. Like any, any job is when you first get started, but it was, um, it was also, you know, a place where I noticed there was a glass ceiling very quickly for women. And, um, I didn't even know that that was a term at the time, but uh, <laughs> it, it was, it, I, I could see how, how it was, you know, there were not a lot of women in, in the creative side of advertising to begin with, but also, um, you know, it, it wasn't, uh, the men's creativity was highly valued where the women's it wasn't as, as a parent. So, um, I, I didn't feel like that was where I wanted to spend the next 50 years of my life. And, um, and in the worst time ever, um, I decided to leave right as the market crashed at the end of 2008. And, um, the worst time, why would you get rid of a job with security and, I, and looking back, you know, I think we didn't know what was really happening economically. So my husband and I were like, let's do it. You can, you know, take your wedding planning business, focus on that. I had kind of started it on the side, um, as most, I think, entrepreneurs do. I, I feel like a lot of us, it's people I've talked to, they kind of dip their toe in while they have a safety net of a corporate job. And that's great. I think, I mean, it, it makes you sure you like it and you're not investing right off the start and you're making sure there's a, there's a place for you in your market. But... Um, but yeah, we decided to just plunge in and, and I did, and I'm glad I did because it was baptism by fire. This market, um, wasn't supporting event planners at the time. And, um, and the, the people that were in the industry, it was a really, it was an old boys club and that surprised me. Really? For event planning? The, yeah. And even wedding planning, or you just found a niche in wedding planning. Well, no, there were wedding planners too, but it was, you were up against a handful of people who had been in the industry a long time. You know, the, the, the people who did the rentals and the floral and, and, um, and they were all men who owned the company and they were, um, very unwelcoming <laughs> to me. And, um, and I wasn't an anomaly. They, they had their click, no matter who would come into the market was going to get kind of stiff armed. And, um, and the, you know, the people that, um, that you were trying to pitch to, they were like, mm, I don't know, it's Wisconsin. We don't need a wedding planner. I mean, that seems really luxurious. <laughs> so it, it still had so many challenges. And there were times I'm like, why did I do this? <laughs> Yeah. Um, but, um, but you I did through. find my, pardon? I said, well, you broke through cause you get, I did, yeah, and... I did, you know, after a while you start to learn that the BS you're saying, um, actually is true and you don't have to, uh, make it up as you go along cause you get better at it. And, um, you just have to keep doing it and keep meeting new people and, and not, and try not to get bogged down with all the negativity in your own insane self doubt. And, um, I, I, I did find an, a niche actually in doing a lot of, um, charity events. That was what got the silver anvil for the company was doing an, a nonprofit event. And, um, and so I spent, I spent a lot of time and energy donating my time or even getting paid very nominally to do these, these types of events, but they were, um, they were great because they were huge and they were a, a wonderful way to learn uh, on the grand scale. So, um, yeah, and get your name out there in a very positive yeah. way. You know, one of the best things you can do as an entrepreneur is figure out a way to get free advertising. And if you've got a, a nonprofit that's promoting an event and, you know, you trade where you get some kind of like sponsorship or some kind of, you know, notoriety within the event and the program and thanks very much, you know, and all this kind of stuff, then other people, because the people that attend go, oh, this was a great event. I, maybe she'll do something for us. And, you know, it opens up doors and, and you're there. So you're mixing, meeting the folks and, you know, and it's, yeah, that's you know, guerrilla marketing 101, right? 
Oh yeah. Oh, you know, I ha I never hear people use that phrase, and it's so. <laughs> kind of old school i don't know that they use that term anymore it was but the, it was, it, they don't but the funny thing is if you use it with like people who are in their 20s or early 30s now they look at you like you've just invented this brand new idea <laughs> <laughs> oh good i'm going to name another i'm going to do a podcast on guerrilla marketing and it'll be like a whole new thing you know <laughs> it, would be, it would be i i mean um it is and honestly to your point um the relationships that were created both working on um, events or working with people who are also on committees with those events, those things have paid off in spades, even far and above the event planning company or anything. It's, it was those interpersonal network, networks that um, have been the most valuable thing I've gotten out of any job, whether that was corporate or in event planning or beyond, um, is the relationships. Um, people don't, you know, don't, they always say networking, but it's like, you have to really like networking is a real thing. And, and you have to genuinely care about the people you're networking with and not just look at them as like a mark, you know, they, they have to be people and people react to that authenticity and it gets you really far, especially if you mean it, you know, oh, yeah. um, we could do a whole, a whole segment on networking. I, I had a, one of my employees a long time ago that I needed to teach her how to go out and network. And there's this old book. She just emailed, she just mailed it back to me. She hasn't worked for me for you know nine years or something like that. And I and she found it when she was like decluttering, and how to work a room. And then I think it's one of the, in you know just as an aside in today's you know digital world of communication that there's a whole generation of folks that are coming out of college or whatever with no idea how to walk up and how, shake somebody's hand and introduce themselves in a face-to-face -face thing. I had many, many years ago, when I first started getting involved, involved in Yelp, I got a, went to one of these um, thank you events that they were doing for their big Yelpers, whatever. And it was all these young folks there. I was clearly a, a more seasoned person in that room. And I went there because I was gonna network. I was like, okay, I'm gonna go meet all these people. I'm gonna do all this stuff. I took one of my, folks that works for me that he was a master networker with me we could we could meet anybody in a room and have a good conversation like you say like you really actually talk to him and I teach this it when I do entrepreneurs raising capital how to network for capital it's a it's a component that you have to be able to have a conversation and draw people in without chasing after them and they you know feel boxed up against the wall right and so the book was called how to, yeah it was how to work a room and i um at this yelp thing we're standing in line to whatever and i'm trying to talk to the people around me and they were all like oh we have to talk to people you know it was really crazy where i was like there's a and i there's, there's an opportunity here for people to go out and teach you know Gen X, Gen Y, whatever. I don't want to say the M yeah. word. I don't want to say the M yeah. word, you know, on how to go out and, and network and, and do that kind of a thing. So anyway, that's an aside. So I'm glad that you, you realize that because you're, you seem pretty young. And so you realize early on starting your own business, it's, it's, it's make or break. If you don't know how to go out and network and follow up and follow through with contacts to create the business, you, you're basically dead in the water. Cause you know, you could, you just get caught lost in the shuffle of social media. If you're just trying to advertise and do that kind of thing, you got to get out there. And, you know. Yes. And, and yes. And the follow up is, is huge. And, and to kind of segue into even doing the coppersmithing, first of all, most of the people who do this, they, they, you pick up the phone and talk to them. You go meet them physically. You spend time with them um, hours and hours in a shop. It's hands-on. It's, it's apprenticeship work like they did 300 years ago. It's, um, you have to be able to, you know, talk to your elders as both peers, but also as mentors. You have to talk to um, people about things that like, you know, I had to go up to people and be like, hi, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't have the terminology. I don't know what I'm doing. All I know is what I want to do. Can you help me? I'm willing to learn. I'm an open book. And, and I received 20 different mentors of, you know, various different walks in, in the metal world, um, who were more than generous with their time and their knowledge and remain part of my life even now. And, um, and that is something I think that can be applied no matter what your field is. I mean, I'm in something really off the wall, but 
no matter what you want to do, it really comes down to maintaining those relationships beyond the networking. Yes, following up. Yes, you know, checking in. Yes, if you say you're going to send somebody a document within 24 hours, like do it. And then if you're an hour late, apologize. Like it's not, you know, it's, it's not like rocket science, but I think it, it gets lost in the shuffle of today's like high speed online presence. Yeah. And, uh, and, and yeah, so, and I, I feel like you asked me a second part to the first question on from corporate world to now, and I don't remember what it was. I'm well, sorry. let me, let's, let me just get in on a point that you just said there, because you talked about the, the event planning and it was like this old, you know, with corporate world, it was a old boys network in the event planning. You had a sort of a geographically, but also old boys network kind of a thing. Cause you're, you know, breaking in within the community and they all knew each other. And here you are, the only woman doing this. And so, but it sounds like you didn't receive the same sort of um, closed doorness. They were very open to you. So, you. so is it the passion to the art that made them open? The fact that anybody even wanted to learn this, they were just happy for that because of a small community that way? Well, I think... Um... I think it was two of the things you said and then some. It it was first and foremost, and I know this this sounds the only way I can explain it is these people I'm talking to, a lot of them would be considered in mainstream society as blue collar workers. They're tradespeople. Yeah. And the only way to share your trade and your knowledge is to be open to talking to other people about it, or it dies when you die. And that mentality is different than white collar, I think, because white collar, you know, you go to college and then, you, you know, the next generation takes over when the other generation retires and everybody knows, you know, if you're an accountant, the next breed of accountants are going to come and it's done. Trades are different. You have to be willing to, to talk and share and teach and because that's the only way. So I think there's that difference in mentality in sharing knowledge. Um, there's it's more of a inclusive mentality as opposed to a competitive one. And, um, and yeah, I was enthusiastic. I'm a woman and that was different. And, um, uh, let me, let me give an example. So the first time I went with my product designer, who's also a young mom like me, we went up to the foundry where they would pour the cast iron for the handles for the copper for my cast iron skillets and things. And, we're two blonde girls and we show up and you could see it in a whole foundry is full of men. And you could see their, the reaction was like, there are girls in the foundry and they say, guys <laughs> would walk back and forth. It's just a check. Yeah. There's, there's chicks in the, but like it was, it was such a, 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 an anomaly and kind of, cool because it was so unique. So I think people responded to the fact that I was a woman. Um, and yeah, they, it's a lost art and I wanted to do something that wasn't being done before. And yeah. this group of people, their reaction was, that's cool. We're in, let's figure this out together. Oh, so, nice. you know, when, and, and I meant what I was doing and I followed through and, um, and I think everyone responded to that really well. And, and, um, so I think it was a lot of factors that came together, but it still feels very serendipitous. And I still feel very lucky um, with what I, what I received from everybody in yeah. the industry. So how long have you been a coppersmith? Four years. Four years. Yeah. I looked yeah. at your website. Why don't you tell everybody your website? Because I was really ama amazed at, um, the variety that you had and you know all of the the different things so we'll in a minute we'll go into your workshop but tell everybody your website and um and then we'll talk a little bit about how you decide what to make and things like that oh sure so the how the the website is just housecopper.com and um you know every house should have copper so housecopper.com and um yeah, that was my mentality. My hope is that everybody figures out that they need like one or two cast iron skillets, maybe one big stock pot, a couple of pieces of copper, 
and some pottery bowls and that's it. That's all you need in your kitchen and it'll get passed on to every generation so that we have less waste and you know, ideally everybody has that. Like no matter your socioeconomic status, I want it to become the norm. Um, I don't know how to do that with the raw material cost of copper, but that's my hope. <laughs> Yeah, so so I mean, when we first talked, okay, we talk about the advantages of using copper and tin, and kind of how you, you know, you didn't just find out about it because you were doing a historical stuff. You learned that it was a better material, and um, and I guess the and then and, and a little bit by why did we get away from it as um, a cooking kind of a concept? I mean, I, because I because. And one of the bargain basement places I go to shop for stuff, they have copper pots as seen on TV or stuff like that, but clearly it's not the same as what you make. So talk a little bit about that, the differences and all of that. Sure. Well, his, yeah, hi historically, um, most kitchens had a handful of very, what we would say kind of um, pure cookware. So things would be made out of clay um, so pottery, things would be made out of iron, just plain old cast iron, and things would be made out of, out of copper or brass, but that's still a, a component of copper. And that was it. We didn't have anything synthetic. We didn't even have aluminum until after the World Wars. So, um, you know, your, your kitchen, I mean, that's why even in Downton Abbey, if you look in, if you watch Downton Abbey and watch what they cook on, they're cooking on copper. Because that was, before the World Wars, that's what they had. And um, you know, it, part of that was because it was the materials that we historically would use, but also people, whether or not they understood the science of it. I mean, copper specifically is 25 times faster than stainless steel. So if you put the two on and, and it needs less heat to get that fat, to be that fast. So it's energy efficient. And, um, especially when it's lined with tin. And part of that is because tin is it bonds to the copper on a molecular level. So that fast heat that you get from the copper kind of pushes through the tin at once and boom, you have um, for very little energy uh, and in very quick time, you have, you know, boiling water or you have your soup is hot or whatever it is. Whereas with stainless, it takes longer. So even if you have those copper pots that are lined with stainless, you may as well just buy a stainless steel pot because you <laughs> copper gets hot and it still has to work its way through the stainless interior. Um, but it's just, it's fast and it's, and it doesn't rust, you know? So sometimes when I'm sitting outside and I'm working on a, one of my pots, I think to myself, there is a good chance somewhere, someday in 5,000 years, someone's going to dig up one of my pots because they don't, they don't corrode. They're not made with iron. They're copper and copper doesn't rust. Um, and even now when we go out, like I'll show you, I'm repairing a, a, a coffee pot that's probably 300 years old. And okay. when it's done... It's, she'll be able to use it. She's going to be able to use this pot and she yes. will be in it usable another hundred years from now. And that's amazing to me. I never get tired of yeah. dealing with a material that is so, um, it is an heirloom. Yeah, that's right. I remember now you talking about a big part of your business is people coming to you to repair things that they, you know, inherited or they discover it some kind of an estate sale or an antique place or something like that. And um, so if people were out and they're doing that kind of a of shopping for that kind of stuff, what do they look for? Would it be, would, you know, it's, it, do people automatically know like a, like a, um, a shop owner that this is something, even though it may not be in great condition, that is highly valuable or, you know, do people just take that stuff and go, you know what, I'm going to go melt it down and sell it for the metal or, um, you know, could talk a little bit about, you know, an antique roadshow or something and how they sure. discover this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Sometimes I get like Uber drivers when they find out what I do, then they take my card and send me photos of like something they have. They're like, can you tell me what this is from? It's like personal antique roadshow. Um, you know, um, First and foremost, a lot of really good antique um, store owners, they understand what they have when they have a copper pot. And I do have relationships with some places that will send me just boxes to refurbish and, uh, and then they'll resell them. They know what they have. Um, if you um, inherit any copper, there's a couple of things. One, 
check and see if, or if you find it at an estate sale, if it's lined with tin or the inside looks kind of really crappy, that's good because that can be refurbished. Um, if you, if you get something that's lined with stainless and the, and it's kind of out of whack or out of shape or the copper's burned out or chipped or sorry, I mean, it's not repairable because I can't get to both sides of the copper because of the stainless interior. So um, when a stainless steel lined copper pot is ruined or um, anything, it's kind of just throw it. It's worthless. You need yeah. it. The only way to make it last is to use those historical pieces or to make it the way they used to hundreds of years ago because then they can be refurbished. And so you look for uh, in interiors, um, and, but something to note, and it's funny, I get a lot of people who think that they have these amazing copper pots, but they're made in a foreign country and the quality of the copper is not pure. And then they wonder why they don't tin up very well. And it's because they're not made with pure copper. They're made with an alloy or they're made a very cheaply um, deoxidized copper and it doesn't take. And so there is a difference in where it was made. So if it was made in Portugal or India or Turkey, it may not refurbish as well as something made in Europe or America. And um, yeah, so that's, you know, kind of see if you can find yeah. a mark. So mark. Where do they find the raw materials for copper? In the U.S. around I here, I get I get my raw uh, sheets out of Houston, Texas. That's where it's smelted. I believe that a chunk of that is actually mined in Arizona, and um, also in Canada. And a good chunk of it is also um, recycled copper, like out of t old TVs. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah. I I put my my v old VCR up on free cycle, saying I think you can at least get the copper out of here for transistors or something like that if you want to, you know, do that. So okay, why don't we go do do a little show and tell and let's see because you say you 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 use utensil or tools that are actually the same sort of tools or the same tools they used hundreds of years ago and stuff mm -hmm. too, right? And yes. so you know, go. I'm I'm fascinated. I can't wait Whoa. to see. We're gonna go I'm on a road trip. Yeah, and on your website, um, say, the, say the website again? Housecopper.com. And do you have videos of you doing this work and stuff on there? Yes, I believe there's a video link um, on the website, or else you can always just find, you know, House Copper on YouTube. And um, hopefully we'll go. So I don't know how the best way to do this. Like, I'm like, this is the garage. I'm going to be <laughs> echoey. This is the shop. Um, so here's kind of my shop, and I know okay. it's really hard to see, um, and I'm gonna take these off, I guess I should have. These tools, if I can, sh if you can see them, can you see yeah. these? Oh yeah, so like a These are hand, or... yeah, those are hand crank tools that are um, several hundred years old. For they instance. Look like they're made out of iron? They're made out of cast iron and, and uh, brass. Um, so this one, and I, I wish there was an easier way to show these, you know, I feel like, you know, but like this one here because is probably from like 1805. Oh, wow. So I still use them to make, you know, I, I'm trying to see if I can, you know, yeah, they're I, really crazy. Yeah. There's the coffee pot that's 300 years old. Oh yeah. Was, oh, wow. That's beautiful. So, Thank you. um, Okay, so so part of your going through your um, apprenticeship on this was even like, oh, there's four of these things that are used for different parts of, you know, and then you had to get them because they're, if they're that old, they're not readily available, right? No. And there's not somebody, you know, making new ones. So no. That, you, you know, you can get uh, very similar tools made in China still to this day because there are tinsmiths, like people who do your HVACs and stuff in your house, those are what tinsmiths are today. So they can get more modernized versions of a lot of these. Um, but I like using the traditional ones, um, you know, and so here, like, I'm going to, like, you can see like that big, um, let's see that right there. Yeah. That's how you cut a lot of big pieces. This is a giant piece that's just for one thing, and that's to put seams into copper. That's it. I mean, all of these tools have one purpose in the entire production of it. So, um, you know, you, you know, this right here, like people, I'm always 
people always go, wow, this is, I mean, it's, it's mass, it's massive. It's just massive. And I know you can't really tell, but I mean, all it is is putting a groove. That's all it's used for. <laughs> so when you were talking earlier about how you get your handles are made out, out of cast iron, mm -hmm. right? And so, yep. so you get those pre-made and then you get, do you get sheets of copper that you melt or smelt into the shape that you have for your pots and things like that? Or how does that go about becoming in the shape of a pot? Sure. Well, so the handles are, um, were designed, I found a traditional old brass piece and then just had it, had my, my friend, you know, my product designer, she like turned, took the actual original handle from the early 1800s and had it turn into a computer program that then could be re-poured into iron. Um, and then the same thing, the sheets of copper get cut with water into the correct circles because I can't smelt in my garage. I mean, you need an entire foundry for that. Um, but they get cut, and then then uh, a couple of guys in Ohio will take these, and they'll, these big circles of flat copper, and they'll pull them on their big, I mean, the CNC machine they use is about as big as half my garage. And they pull the copper up, the, the, the tool I had made. And, um, and you, they do that, and they have to watch it, because if they take it off, too soon, the copper is so soft, the pot would collapse or get or be really soft when you're cooking. And if they don't take it off fast enough, it'll work harden so much that the top rim will crack. So they have to know what they're doing and they had to figure it out too. They had no idea what they were, if you would have asked them five years ago if they could spin copper, they'd be like, maybe. I mean, nobody was doing it. What were they doing before that they had a spinner or whatever? Oh, um, aluminum stuff, aluminum and steel, stainless steel, um, but never copper because copper is this whole different crazy animal. And uh, people in this country were not used to it. I mean, I spent probably months on the phone trying to find someone who would help me do this because every answer was, we don't do that and we don't know where to send you. Sorry. So, I mean, so you recognize there was an opportunity because, or you, you assumed you know, oh, people, because, yeah. yeah, they're going to, they're going to, even though people don't really make these things anymore, people are going to want them. And so um, you spent months researching it, finding partners, learning how to do it and learning what you needed. Cause you don't know what you don't know till you discover that you didn't know it. Right. 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 And so, I mean, that's just, that's just fascinating. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of it within a context of something else that, you know, I mean, it's pure, you know, even though copper pots have, have been around for hundreds of years, it really feels like you invented, almost invented something new, you know, almost like, you know, so now the guys that, that mentored you or you apprenticed with, do, do they make pots or are they using something are they doing something different one of the guys has his copper cookware company but he's basically making um french cookware designs on american soil that's kind of his gig and i specifically wanted to make american designs which we really only had for um you know a, a short time before you know, because we were either copying European designs or we started making aluminum cookware. So we're talking, a, you could count it in decades, when we had like the fur trade kettles and we had specific American designs um, that a lot of them are lost to posterity. So I, when I did this, I said, I want to make what's no longer made. And um, and that's, of course, comes with its own challenges and everybody's freaking out about different things because nobody knows what we're doing. Um, and then I also... Um, have an actual authentic apprenticeship with a master smith, a master tinsmith is what he calls himself. I do more copper, he does more tin. He's 70 and his name is Bob and he's got a white beard <laughs> and he wears suspenders and he has a garage shop and I go up there a few times a week for a handful of hours whenever I can get away from kids and my work and stuff and, I, and he's the one who, who taught me the traditional methods that I could apply even more towards you know the modern cookware that you see on my website because it's all still there it's just sometimes you know you're using different gauges of copper in your or you know 
some people come to me and they, they want custom things. Well, I can only do that using the old ways. So, um, and I've had that apprenticeship now for three years and he's been awesome. Yeah. It's like, so old school. Yeah. So when you, so you're making a, a quart pot, you know, whatever. Um, and you were figuring it, the, so you, you start out with sort of like traditional kind of, these are the kind of pots that everybody needs and stuff like that. If, when those guys were learning how to spin it and these things, or you were learning, if you make a mistake, are you able to reuse the copper and start over again? Oh, okay. That's good. So, yeah. So you, so what it, you know, I always think, I think about those like um, American Express commercials, you know, got this, got this, or this, and, and finally it's priceless, right? So tell, talk about that feeling when you made your first pot and it actually worked and you were like, we're done. Here it is. My, it, it worked. It's, it's, I mean, right. You know what it was? It was, oh, thank God I can do this. I don't have to find another job. <laughs> um, because I still am, even though I'm the only woman and even though there's so few people doing this and it is a specialized trade that no one can ever take away from me, it's still incredibly scary because every day there's a learning experience, every day there's a challenge, every day I have to make it up. I mean, even fixing that, that copper um, coffee pot, I showed the guys, there's a handful of, of men and me and on a Facebook copper smithing site and I showed them the hole in this pot I would have to repair. And they're all like, just give up. Just ask them if they can, you can make them a new one. Like, just give up. And I was like, no, no, no. I think I can figure it out. And I did. And, but it was like, you know, we all still are like figuring it out because even a lot of the old guys that are doing this, they're figuring it out as they go along. And, and we're all getting together going, what's your favorite flux? I mean, did anyone discover the best? Because nobody knows, because no one wrote it down and we're all guessing. And so it's still this, this, it's still scary all the time because I still feel like I could mess up at any time and just have to quit. So it, you know, cause there's not the same support system that's never been done. There's no roadmap. I don't know what point I'm going to hit a wall. I'm not going to be able to, you know, go over. So it's, it's kind of like entrepreneurship on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you used the word flux. What's is that a oh yes when you go? right flux when you are um when you tin the inside of a copper pot I can give visuals so like this is one of my skillets this is what it looks like before it's food safe so it's still copper on the inside and then I have to put it over fire. So I had built a fire in, in my garage. And in order to get the tin, which makes it food safe and makes it nonstick and everything, to stick to and bond molecularly to the copper, I have to spray like a fluid. Um, and it creates the, the molecular bond. It helps bond things. I mean, back in the day, they used like pine rosin. So <laughs> now we have mechanical. And then when it's done, you know, the insides will look like this. Oh, shiny. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then the outside, oh, there, yeah, because that's like well, well used. That's the that inside looks brand new. The outside's all covered with char. Yeah, that was an old piece that, um, uh, that actually belonged to Daniel Duna, um, who was a chef in the 80s, well known uh, chef in the 80s. And he, uh, this is one of his pieces. Um, that his daughter sent to me. So, you know, so I mean, you the, can tin, the tin melted and you, cause that's what was up on the side. So do you spin it around? Oh, yeah. or how do you get it to be even? Well, I keep, I'm standing over the fire with the pot. With like one of these I, giant head things to keep the heat off yeah. of you and stuff like that and big gloves and. Oh okay. yeah. Yep. And then, um, and then once I, once the pot is hot enough, you spray in the flux, which you get, you know, it's not, it's dangerous. I get burned a lot. <laughs> and, um, and then, um, and then you can, the, the pot is hot enough that the tin will melt into it. And then I'm digging my hand while it's over the fire and I'm moving all the molten, molten metal around and getting it to, um, to, to tin line. And you have to do it right or the tin looks like shit. So it's like, <laughs> it's a constant struggle. <laughs> 
And then if you, it, like, if you do get it where, like, down in the corners or something, and, and it drips, I mean, I can't even spray paint, it drips, right? And so, right. you know, you get, you have to start all over again and melt the tin off. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Yes, sometimes I have to strip and start all over or put it over the heat. Some pots I'll put over the heat three, four times and they still don't take or they don't, you know, it just, it's, it, there's no um, guarantee. Anytime I'm using an old pot, I don't know how, what kind of copper it is. I don't know how it'll react. I don't, I mean, every pot is a little bit scary, but yeah. you do it. So with the, the hole, so when they're like on that hole that you had, do you, I mean, to me, the obvious thing would be is like you get another piece of copper and you just slap it on there and polish it and sand it down. And obviously that's, it wasn't that easy. So, you know. No, no. Because you don't um, melt the copper. You're not melting the copper to fit in there and you can't do just the seam because then it's not going to be smooth. And is that a trade secret? Can you share how, what you figured out to be able to do that? Yes, you can, you can do a patch. Um, that one, I had to do a specific type of patch because the, the copper was so old and so brittle that if I were to do a normal patch, I would have actually melted the copper away. So I had to do something totally different. But what normally you do, if you have an old pot that's tin lined, it has a crack um, or, you know, something happened where it cracked for whatever reason or it got really, really hot and brittle and it cracked. Very rare, but it happens. You braise it. So you have to get it insanely hot and you take tin and copper and you make brass. Let me see. I think you, maybe I can show it. I don't know. Can you see there's like a seam? Oh, sure. Like, like brass. Yeah. That, that's how you, and how they used to for many years before they had like metal spinning machines. That's how they would seal the copper and it would make it waterproof and it would take away, you know, you'd be able to patch anything using extreme high heat. And um, and making making brass essentially, it's it's amazing. It's such an amazing trade, and it's one of those things where it's like I you know people will be like we'll stop by and we'll hang out and just see your shop, and two hours later they still haven't left because <laughs> it's just there's so much to learn and it's so interesting because everybody cooks and everybody what? wants to know about what they're cooking in and everybody realizes suddenly that they've never asked the questions about their cookware the way they've asked same question you know certain questions about their food and it opens up a world that you know they never thought about you know we're so used to just pulling something out and starting to cook and and it's really fun because everyone understand everyone uses cookware so um, everyone feels connected to it too and that's that's really fun the sharing so when are they going to have a TV show? They do all these other TV shows about all these, you know, fixing up uh, hot rod cars and all kinds of stuff. Where's the copper show? <laughs> um, we're, we're working on it, actually. There's, okay. There's, I might there have to a... watch HDTV to watch you on, the, on there. <laughs> you're on there. I'm going to go we'll subscribe have... to your YouTube channel. This is fascinating. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's, um, it is a really fun thing. And, um, um, and it's been fun on YouTube too, to see a lot of people who are like, I think I want to try this. So, <laughs> you go, yeah, bring it on. We need I'm like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. I finally was like, okay, here's a safety video. If you guys are really doing this, please use all of this equipment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, they are, there is, um, there is talk and there is, um, it's a showrunner. Um, and people out in LA and there, there's buzzing, but you know, who knows when it happens, I'll be excited and I want to share all of this, but until then, I guess it's just YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So we've been chatting for a while and, um, uh, probably I'm just fascinated to probably talk, you know, another hour, whatever. Uh, but <laughs> so I don't know that people would necessarily listen to that. So I want to encourage everybody, uh, to go watch the YouTube on this, even if you've listened to the podcast, because it is quite interesting. And, um, and I want to encourage folks, uh, you know, please, I, the star of the show here is Sarah. You, you need to go to her website, but mine is karenrands.co, and you can get information about my book, and you can uh, learn what we do to help entrepreneurs. Um, the main thing that I've always wanted to do is um, empower entrepreneurs to pursue their passion and that's why my tag of compassionate capitalism and I talk about you know creating wealth through funded innovation and so the innovation in Sarah's business is that she 
stepped back in time and brought a lost art back into the mainstream in effect or getting there, you know, awareness of it. And so there's, it's using old tools, but it's really, I think, very innovative because it, it is a lost art. And so, and, and, and entering into the unknown of figuring out how to solve these problems on a daily basis as you work through it and you are, you know, and, and to be able to get clearly such joy out of doing that, you know, that's, there's wealth in financially, but also in your daily, you know, just joy waking up and doing what you, what you do on a daily basis. So congratulations on that. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, letting me wax on about copper on here. It's always my <laughs> That's my favorite thing to talk about. So <laughs> it'll be, it's awesome. So what, anything you want to leave with our listeners and our viewers on, you know, entrepreneurism on, you know, forging the way that you did any women business, anything you want to little golden copper tidbits you, you want to leave? You know, the one thing uh, and the way I kind of now run my life and I think it works for the, you know, a mentality of entrepreneurialism is to just, if you, if you want to try something, just do it and don't overthink it and, um, and do it, do it, do it well and do it right and do it, you know, so, you know, I, I have friends now and they go, I, I have my, you know, this business I'm kind of starting and when I get caught and I start to overthink it and I start to get nervous and I think, what would Sarah do? She'd tell me to just do it. Yeah. So, you know, just do it and, 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 and forge ahead knowing that you're going to get hit with a oh, hundred unknowns and then some. But then just keep doing it and yeah. it'll pay on. It'll pay well, on. and it's, you know, there's, there's this trendy term called growth hack, right? And that's, and, and what it really means is that as you're moving through your process, you're, you're interacting with your customers. So you know exactly what it is that they want. And you do that really on a daily basis. I mean, there was a, a kind of a selfish motivation for you to get started because you saw this as a lost artisan to bring in and you wanted to do that, but then you quickly found that there were people out there that were looking for somebody to be able to do that. And um, they come to you with, whether it's fixing an heirloom or, you know, I want to get this type of a, of a pot, or do you have anything else like this? Or somebody responds and asks you now you know that there's another type of pot or something that people might want and things like that. So um, very good. All right. Well, uh, Thank you very much, Sarah, for taking your time and showing us uh, all about the, the grand new world of uh, copper pots. And <laughs> well, thanks again, Karen. Uh, this was awesome fun. <laughs> and Thank you. I really, really enjoyed it. So with that, I'm going to say um, uh, onward and upward is always how I finish my shows, you know, because you're, you're, you are, you just get, the, get in the business, get in the market, do what you got to do, fix it. And move forward. If you if you hit a bump, climb over, get over the bump, and just keep going, keep on keeping on. And thank you very much, Sarah. I really enjoyed having you on the show today. Thank you.